Okay, folks, our final topic in Physics 2 is entitled Topic H, and it is all about the Big Bang. So it's how, all about how the universe started. So, the Big Bang Theory, I'm sure you've all heard of it, and we are not referring to the TV programme, we are talking about a theory that describes how the universe began. And all the, this theory says that you need to know is that about 13 billion years ago, uh, the universe was just a tiny, tiny point, so everything in the universe was concentrated into a single point. Everything. And then it exploded. And everything was flung out away from this point and has just been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And even though this explosion happened 13 billion years ago, the universe is still expanding outwards. So we still see all that matter, all that stuff being thrown away exactly as if it had just been an explosion. So that's the theory. It's about how the universe started. Uh, so what evidence do we have for this? Well, if we have a look around us, what we can see are other galaxies. And all these other galaxies are moving away from us. And the ones that are further away are moving faster. Now that's uh, really good evidence for the Big Bang because um, anything, if you ever look at anything from an explosion, all the things that get thrown away from the point of the explosion, they all move away from that point and the things that are further out move faster. So our observation of the galaxies moving away and the further away ones moving faster supports the idea that the universe began with this big explosion. Now, the other piece of evidence we have is the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMBR, or sometimes just CMB. Now, this is um, kind of like what we've done is we've just looked at the, the universe in all directions, and we've taken its temperature. And its temperature is so cold that we don't even recognise it as being infrared, which is the heat we're used to. It's gone all the way down to microwave radiation. But if we look everywhere in the universe, it's the same on average everywhere. So the universe is about 3 degrees Kelvin, um, which is sort of minus 270 degrees Celsius. And it's on average the same everywhere. And if we look at the age of the universe and that temperature, that microwave background radiation, it confirms that the time scale and the uh, average energy being the same everywhere confirms the idea that we started with an explosion. So what you need to know is galaxies far away from us are moving faster than the ones near to us, but they're all moving away, and that there is this microwave background radiation that is the same everywhere in the universe. For the higher paper, you need to be able to talk about something called redshift. So with redshift, it's just um, the idea that when objects move away from an observer, so if I see something moving away from me, if that thing moving away is emitting waves, the waves change if the object is moving away from me compared to if it was just staying the same distance away. It's the same idea as with um, ambulance sirens. If you've ever stood and listened to an ambulance siren go past you, the tone, the pitch of it changes depending on when it's moving towards you, it's right next to you and when it's moving away. And that's the same thing because the sound waves are being changed because the ambulance is moving. Now with light, what we see is um, the light shifts towards the red end of the spectrum. Now, if you just have a look at the pictures here, uh, the first one, oops, Daisy, the first one is showing you what it looks like, this one here, showing what it looks like when the object is not moving. So these black lines here, these represent um, the bits that I'm interested in, basically. Now, if you look at the second one, this one, the object is now moving away from me. So the black lines are in the same pattern, they're the same distance apart, they look very similar to the one above, they've just all shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And that's what we call redshift. And if we look at the light from stars that are moving away, that oh, if we just look at the light from stars full stop, they all appear to be redshifted. And the ones further away are more redshifted, which shows that they're moving faster. So that's what we need to know for the higher paper, just redshift and that the light from stars is redshifted and the further away they are, the more it's redshifted. And that just tells us that they're moving away from us. Okay, the next thing we need to be able to talk about is the life cycle of stars. Now, you need to know different bits of the life cycle depending if you're on the higher or the foundation. Now, I'm going to go in order and I'll tell you when it changes. To start with, if you're doing the higher, you need to know how stars begin. 
So stars are formed from nebulas, which are just clouds of hydrogen and maybe a little bit of helium, but basically just dust. So they start from nebula. Um, the dust all gets clumped together because of gravity. So all the gravity pulls the dust together and then it becomes what we call a protostar. So because we've pulled it all together, it gets a little bit hot and it starts to glow. And that's a protostar. The next step is the main sequence. Now this is a really, really long period of time. So stars will stay in this for about 10 billion years. Now our sun is about halfway through this. So our sun is in its main sequence and it's still got a long time to go, so sort of 5 billion years left. So that's the main sequence, that's the main bit. Now gradually it will become hotter and eventually, by the time the sun reaches the end of its main sequence, it'll be too hot for life on Earth. But we've got about 2 billion years until that happens, so... I think we're good for a while yet. So, for the foundation paper, you need to know what comes after the main sequence. Now, after the main sequence, the star gets bigger. The hydrogen runs out, and it becomes, it starts to burn helium instead of hydrogen, and that just makes it bigger. So we call it a red giant, and it is much, much bigger than it was uh, before. So after it becomes a red giant, uh, it gives off um, a nebula, so basically all the outer bit of the star just flings off into space as dust, which forms a planetary nebula from which new stars can form. And at the centre, what's left just in the middle is what we call now a white dwarf. So it's just it's still quite hot, which, was, which is why it glows white, and then it gradually cools until it's no longer giving off light and it becomes a black dwarf. Now, if we've got a really, really big star, so much bigger than our star, um, it can become a red supergiant instead of a, a red giant. So this is an alternate route depending on the size of the star. So after its main sequence, if it's really big, it becomes a red supergiant. After being a red supergiant, it undergoes what we call supernova. There's lots of information there about supernova, but basically you need to know that um, the star explodes and it gives off loads and loads of light and it's pretty epic if it happens. Um, they're so bright that you'd be able to see them during the daytime. Um, they're sort of brighter than a whole galaxy of stars. So the really big stars, they go red supergiant, then they supernova, then they either become neutron stars, which um, are stars that are really, really dense and make uh, neutrons, or the really, really big ones become black holes. So black holes are so concentrated, with, there's so much mass concentrated in such a small space that the gravity is strong enough to capture anything in it, including light, which is why we can't see them, because uh, the light gets sucked in so we can't see anything. The only way we can tell they're there is because of the way they affect things around them. Okay, so to try and give you a summary of what happens, because it's all a bit confusing. So we start with a nebula. If it's really, really low mass, we end up with a failed star, which is just a brown dwarf. Otherwise, our nebula goes to make a protostar, which goes to make a main sequence star. If it's low mass, we make just a white dwarf. If it's an average mass, so the same as our sun, we would make a red giant, which would then make a planetary nebula and the white dwarf. If it's a really big star, we make a red supergiant, which then goes supernova. Then if it's a smaller one, we'd end up with a neutron star. And if it's a bigger one, we end up with a black hole instead. So those are our options. That's the life cycle of a star. And it all just depends on how big it is. And I know there's a lot there, but it's not too, hopefully it's not too confusing. You just need to know the steps, really. OK, so the last thing we need to talk about is um, some observations made by Galileo and Copernicus. So Copernicus, about 500 years ago, was one of the first people to suggest that the Earth was not at the centre of the universe. So that was generally the commonly held idea, was that God made the universe for us, so we were at the centre of it. And he suggested we weren't. He suggested that the Sun was at the centre of the solar system, and the Earth went around the Sun. So rather than the Sun going around the Earth, which was the commonly held idea. And after Copernicus, um, about 100 years later, we got Galileo. And Galileo was um, an Italian, 
and he used his telescope, so he was one of the first people to use telescopes to observe the movement of stars and planets in our sky. And his observations supported Copernicus's theory. And that's what you need to know for foundation. For the higher paper, you need to know that, um, unfortunately for Galileo, um, the time he was making these uh, statements, the Catholic Church was very much in power and they really didn't like what he was saying. They considered it heresy, and he was arrested and kept under arrest for the rest of his life because of his ideas. So because of um, these ideas about the Earth not being at the centre of the universe, Galileo and Copernicus's ideas took a very long time to be accepted. Uh, nowadays, we know it's true. It absolutely makes sense. The Earth is not the centre of the universe. It's not the centre of the solar system. We are just one of many tiny little specks of dust floating through the universe. Um, so that's the thing. We do accept it now, but we didn't at the time, but mostly because it contradicted uh, Catholic beliefs. Okay, so that is it. That is us done. That is our GCSE in science complete. We just need to make sure you do lots of revision, practice lots and lots of questions. And if you do have any questions, please, please, please do not hesitate to ask. I will always get back to you.